Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? Hope everybody's going uh, doing good. I am uh, finishing up about a week, actually almost 10 days on the road. Pros and cons to, uh, to spending a lot of your time on the road. Definite pro is getting the chance to see people you haven't seen in a long time and connect with new people. So this uh, last weekend, I was in Madison, Wisconsin for the CrossFit Games. I've been to quite a few of them uh, over the course since working for CrossFit and just being involved in that community. Uh, this is the first year that it was out in Madison, and it was uh, certainly geographically different from where it was in the Los Angeles area, but you get the same vibe. And, I, you know, I leave every single time inspired by the capacity of the people that are competing there. It it never fails to make me feel uh, like just a lazy sack of shit watching these incredibly strong, capable people competing at a level that I think is likely unachievable or unattainable for me. Probably not from a physical perspective. I just don't have the uh, mental toughness, the drive, the focus, or the desire to go to that level. But every time I'm around him, I walk away from it uh, very inspired and just puts me back on track mentally to see what they're able to do. And while I was out there, ran into a guy that I met in 2008. His name's Jason Kalipa. And if you are familiar with the CrossFit world, his name is probably going to ring out as one of the not the first CrossFit Games winner, but I believe he was the second in 2008, and he's an, he's an absolute beast, and that's how I first got introduced to him. But he's a lot he's a lot deeper than that. Um, I was actually teaching CrossFit seminars at the time in 2008, and in 2009, he came on board the seminar staff, and I don't know if it was by design or it was just pure luck, but he and I ended up working together quite frequently, we got to know each other pretty well, and have stayed in contact, and I've always enjoyed... Uh, meeting up with him and talking with him. He's he's a great guy. Beyond the physical aspect, which he looks like a freaking silverback gorilla walking around. Wildly impressive. But he he's like a beacon of positivity, which <laughs> people would probably say the apps uh, the opposite about me. So it's great to meet my uh, to meet my axis in the world and you know the guy he's constantly smiling. Always willing to take a picture with somebody who comes by and recognizes him. Always willing to have a conversation with somebody, uh, regardless of you know what it is or what he's doing. He'll take the time for everybody that comes up to see him, and I think that's great. Great ambassador for what it is that he's doing. He's got an amazing family, and his family has gone through some, uh, or is going through, some challenges that, oh, man, I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. But again, the way that he's dealing with it, the way that his wife is dealing with it, it's a shining example of positivity and what's possible by you know focusing on the positive and just keeping your head screwed on straight. Uh, he was only out in Madison for a short period of time. I begged, borrowed, and stealed, uh, stole, stealed. Wow, what a word! Begged, borrowed, and stole some of his time. Uh, got him early in the morning, and uh, it was great to sit down and just chat with you know kind of everything from how we met to what he's up to these days business advice for somebody who's looking at the uh, the affiliate world inside of the CrossFit ecosystem. Uh, it flew by. I wish I wish I could have had more of his time, and I'll definitely be linking up with him again in the future. So here you go. Cleared Hot episode number nine. We're almost in double digits. Episode number nine with Jason Kalipa. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Captain, cleared hot. There we go. I got my coffee. I got my... I don't. I was going to attempt to my say fancy that. fancy bubble water. La, La Croix. I've... <laughs> I don't know if it's La Croix, La Croix. Here's Whatever what I know. I'm not a linguist, so I'm just, I do the same thing. I'll take the fancy bubbly officer water, please, in the, uh, in the green. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, you were cracking me up yesterday, man. You're like, I'm going to ask you questions. I'm fired up. I am. <laughs> well, dude, every time we get together, man, I remember, you know, all those seminars we taught together every time, every opportunity I had, I bet, Hey bro, give me a, give me a, give me a war story. Give me a, give me a fight story. Mainly because I've never had those experiences in my life. Yeah. Right. You're good. I come from this background, you know, where I've lived a very, uh, I don't want to call it sheltered life, you know, but I went to school, I worked hard and got into different things, but I've never been in the military. Yeah. I've never been, uh, 
you know, across from someone trying to shoot at me. And so I'm always intrigued by it because it gives Which is you, a good thing. I'm just going to interject it, there. It, it is a good thing, but it gives you <laughs> access into a world that you only see on movies and that a lot of that's all fabricated and whatever. And so when you actually talk to someone that's been over there, I've always been intrigued by it. Uh, yeah. Stop talking about things I was going to ask you about, like your <laughs> up, upbringing. Where, where I was sitting, you know, I was sitting down today. And I don't dodge even, my question there, Andy. Yeah. Um, how the hell did we meet and when? I mean, I know we met through the CrossFit world, but I was trying to think back of actually when it was because you in your, you know, rise in that environment, you won the 2008 games, right? Yeah. And nobody was kind of really paying attention. There was actually almost no footage that existed of you winning the final event. Actually, the footage that did exist of me winning was my own footage, like uh, like my wife taking it with like a big, you know, the one of those old school cameras. And, and, you know, so we're talking, wow, nine years ago now, the difference between, so we're sitting in Madison, Wisconsin with a huge event in comparison to where the event was, you know, at Dave's parents' house, right? Mm -hmm on you know the trucking supply area with, oh yeah you guys were doing clean we're on the dirt on a, yep. I was gonna say on a yep. dirt field yeah the difference between the two but I definitely remember you from there but did we know each other before you won that or did we meet each other afterwards I think we met each other afterwards or uh, you know some people had, had met me before because of Freddie at, at One World in, in Austin but for the most part you know that was my opportunity to get to know a lot of the people in the CrossFit space so in 08 obviously winning kind of you know allowed me to meet a lot of different people from yeah. Greg to Nicole to this and that. And then, you know, over that next year, I I got more into seminars and things of that nature. And then I got on seminar staff in early 09 or in 09. And that's where you and I had the opportunity to uh, do a lot of fun things. I'll give you guys, for for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm going to summarize Andy Stump <laughs> in a very good story. Okay, so this point is now, this becomes Jason's podcast. So continue. Yeah, yeah so I... <laughs> I uh, <laughs> So Andy and I had taught a few seminars together and he would always pick on the, yeah, I don't know if it's a seal thing. I don't know what it is, but you'd always pick on me. And I remember one time. I'm going to had... stop you right there. That's not the right term. I would correct you when you deviated from the standard I was looking for. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so we're doing the circle jerk. Remember that? Dude. Oh, well, see, now, here's the thing, right? We're audio only. So we're going to have to explain this. The circle <laughs> jerk, as it was lovingly referred to by the staff, was when the, the participants, you would teach the mechanics of a clean with a medicine ball. Yeah. You would put them in a large circle with a... Uh, seminar staff member in the middle, which when Jason was around, because of how often he would deviate from that standard I was talking about, I would put him in the middle and we would learn lessons with things in our hands. So <laughs> this one time we had, we did it with, uh, he had me grab 55 pound dumbbells. And so the group, the students had medicine balls. Yes. The you students had, had medicine balls. And so they're doing it with like a 12 pound medicine ball, right? <laughs> Fluffy, comfortable. <laughs> And I'm doing with these 55 pound dumbbells in both arms. And I remember we were hitting positions and we would have to pause in these different positions. And I finished that up and I had just never been, I was just so wrecked because you have, you know, 50 participants watching you to like look at you as a demonstrate, as a demo of what it's supposed to look like. I'm sitting there shaking with dumbbells over my head. Just like, ah, oh man, <laughs> those are some good times, man. We, we taught a lot of good seminars. We had a lot of good times doing that. Yeah. The, oh, what was it? Oh, nine. I was definitely... I was doing a lot of seminars in 09 and then in late 09, early 2010, I backed off. I think I did my last one in really early 2010 because I had to go on a, a quick vacation for a bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that what they call it these yeah. days, huh? <laughs> it, uh, yeah, to go, uh, had to go check some stuff out somewhere else. But like before that, like, I mean, to go back to even you winning the games, like what was your, let's go back even farther. I mean, like, where are you from? So I'm from San Jose, California. So my, my well, dad's from Iran. Well, you need to move because you still live there. A, well, yeah. Now I live in Los Gatos, which Stop is like it. San Jose South. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. So my dad's from Iran yep. originally. He moved here um, right before the revolution uh, in uh, seventy, like late seventies. What caused him to move here? So he came here for education, and then at the time he just mainly he just came here for education, mm-hmm. and then after that, my entire family came over um, during the revolution, or right after, right during the revolution, they all came over, and then my mom was originally from rhode island and then she came out here because her dad um her dad took the whole family out here so my they're from rhode island uh originally from italy and then my dad's from iran are they still living in uh san jose uh yep so they're still in san jose my whole family's over there you know it's been 
the support system, especially with my daughter being sick, has been really cool to see. And so we have, you know, my my father in law, the, the whole family, they yeah. all live in the Bay Area. It's so nice. we're not moving. Yeah, when they need to rally together and come oh, yeah. together. So I'm assuming you were athletic of some kind in, in sports. So you had to have a pretty deep background. So public yeah. public school system, silver spoon kid, which one are we talking here? Uh, we're talking not public school system. Oh, uh, <laughs> Private school system. Yep. Uh, so many questions have just been answered in my mind. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why I am the way I am. Um, I, I, so, so private school system, I got into um, uh, BMX racing at an early age, which kind of, uh, I think, shaped you know, some of the things. I found some neighborhood kids who weren't going to my private school who were a little bit of a – they came from a different background. So they skateboarded and BMX. My private school did more of the traditional sports like basketball, et cetera. So I got really into BMX and uh, I started racing on a, on a national level and uh, up until I was about 15, 16, yeah. about 15. And then that's when I got into high school and then I found football. So the timing was just kind of unique because in BMX, you turn pro when you when you're 16, I never ended up turning pro. And then I, I found uh, football, like I got hurt right before. And right before it, football? Right before I was going to ask you, I mean, don't. BMX kind of has a pretty high injury, right? I mean, when they, you go over the bars or whatever, I mean, yeah. it's pretty gnarly, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we I've had some friends get really messed up. I broke my um, I broke my face, which is one of the reasons why I might look so weird. Um, I broke my face one time, so what happened is... What bone in your face are you so talking like about? My whole nose... You got can't just say you broke your face. Well, like, my whole nose got like compressed in, right? Okay. And uh, so I went over the bars. I was doing this rhythm section. Boom, I hit my whole face. And it's, it's weird because... I had to go get it kind of re redone a little bit and they put magnets in my nose to keep it straight. It was super weird. Cause like here I am like an eighth grader and I had two magnets in my nose to keep it straight. And I would be able to grab a magnet from the refrigerator and put it on the outside of my nose and it would stay on my nose. Why did they use magnets? I don't know, man. So it was two magnets on either side of the nostril. Were they, were they uh, magnetized towards each other? Yeah. Okay. Like that's why straight. then. All right. And uh, anyways, that was, Anyway, so I got hurt doing that. Were you how big were you when you were doing that? Because I mean, you're you're above average size wise. Yeah. Like, were you? I was a bigger. I was a bigger BMX guy, but that can't be to your benefit. I would no, assume. but I trained really hard. Like I used to be in my garage all the time, uh, you know, training, training the speed, training what I need to do, and so it turned out, you know, I performed well. But then when I found football and I found like, the community aspect of it, made some friends. That was that was the end of BMX. Yeah. What position did you play in football? I played a defensive end, then I played guard. Did you go to college? I went to college. I didn't play football in college. So going through high school, I, I played, uh, I threw the shot. Yep. Right. And I also played football. And right before I was going into college, I, uh, I wanted to play football. I did. And so I started pursuing opportunities in the Bay Area. One of the schools I was talking to ended up dropping their football program. And it was just kind of all meant to be. Because I ended up going to West Valley for two years and then got into Santa Clara University. So all my friends went to Santa Clara, Santa Clara. I didn't make it in. And then I didn't make it in two more times after that. But then I finally did. And I graduated at the same time. <laughs> so three, third time's a charm to get into Santa Clara. And what year did you graduate? I graduated in 04 okay. from high school. And then at the time, you know, I was kind of like the, I was kind of just a jackass in high school. I mean, I was like that kid who just, didn't really care. I, I, I got by with my grades, but it turns out that just getting by won't get you where you want to get to, right? Shockingly enough, when Shock the GPA matters and it's competitive, yeah. Shockingly enough. So, you know, I, I get to I get to um I get to college and I just get woken up like hey man, I gotta I gotta put in the work. And yeah. so that was when I started working full time, started a clothing company, uh, and then and then obviously went to school. And so after two more ap applications, my high school grades got turned like got Yeah got released yeah. and so then they just went off my college and i got in what was the clothing company faded lifestyles <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you're an interesting cat how did how that end up working out for you dude so for a while so for a while it worked out not that great so <laughs> so i i went to um i used to work at the front desk at a gym uh in high school and then i started doing sales when i got into college because i wanted to make more money and I had more time on my hands. And so I would go to school in the morning and then I'd work sales at night because that's when a lot of the people go into the gym, right? So it was a good time to work. Yeah. You know, during the day, the guys who worked there full time would just be kind of twiddling their thumbs because there's no walk-in traffic. And so I started making some good money. 
and uh, I wanted to invest it. So I invested in a few things and I learned a lot about it. So one of them was called Batter Blaster, which was the greatest invention ever that ended up flopping. So I learned a lot about that. What was it? So the Batter Blaster. So check this out. It's going to blow your mind. So you know, like when you make a waffle, <laughs> oftentimes you have to make a, like a decent sized amount of mix. Like, okay. You know what I mean? Like you're not just going to make, but you, maybe you only want one waffle. Maybe you only want one pancake. And so Jason, who the fuck wants one waffle I'm just or saying, one pancake? It's, it's possible. So for me, this, this, I was introduced to <laughs> organic waffle in a can. So think cheese whiz, but organic waffle making. I've mix. actually seen, I haven't seen it organic, but I've seen batter like that in like the, just the can. Yeah, like, shh, you know, so I was introduced to it. And at the time, I think I invested like 2,500 bucks and it got me like, you know, whatever shares and I was fired up. So they started doing well, started doing well. And I wanted to invest more of my money. So I, I put another 2,500 in. And at the time, here I am like a, whatever, 17-year-old kid or whatever it was, 18. That's and a lot of money. That was a lot of money. Yeah. So I invested, invested. And then I learned a lot about that because the product was actually pretty cool. And they got into Costco. But they couldn't keep up, keep up with the demands. And so this guy had an idea of how much he thought the company was worth. He had had opportunities to sell it. He wouldn't take it. And they ended up going belly up because he couldn't keep up the demands and it just became this troubling thing. They grew too fast without that infrastructure behind it. Yeah, and he wouldn't take the money. So, you know, it, that taught me a lot because I didn't know the owner of the company. I have no idea who he was. And I wish I had taken the time to, before I invested in anything after that. Research it. There was one other time I didn't do that, but and that didn't work out well either. But just research more about who actually is running the show because, you know, I had no control over it. Yeah, when you're, when you're beholden to somebody else steering the wheel, yeah, with no say and your money on the line, yeah, it can be super dangerous. Yeah. So you graduated uh, college in what? Oh eight. Oh eight. Yeah. So back to the faded lifestyles. So, oh yes, please. So, <laughs> so I learned a lot about the the batter blaster. That was a really good one. And uh, so with faded, a couple of buddies of mine, we wanted to start a clothing company. And so, you know, I was one of the major investors in that guess, and uh, I invested some money. And so we started. Um, we created this brand where it was basically a nightlife brand, right? So I was going to ask Faded, are we oh, talking yeah. like worn jeans or are you talking hammered out of your mind? Faded? Hammered out of your mind. All right. And dude, I just remember, you know, we would show up and we'd show up to these clubs. My cousin was a club promoter. <laughs> Here we are like 18 years old. We'd have our black Faded Lifestyle <laughs> shirt oh, God. with Faded across in cursive. And we would just get up there and no one would know who we are. And we'd be like, and my buddy would get on the, my, my cousin would get on the mic and be like, Hey man, tonight's drinks are brought to you by, or, or tonight's club appearance is brought to you by Faded Lifestyles. Look, not that many people would cheer or be late in the night and everybody would be really faded. They'd be like, yeah, faded. And we'd throw out shirts and here we are like 18 years old. And we, we printed our own shirts. We learned a lot about business and that ended up not uh, going anywhere. But I learned a lot about partnerships. I learned a lot about investing. I learned how to print my own shirts and, um, Learn that starting a business is not as easy as people think. You know, I think people sometimes look at these businesses and think that they could do it, and frankly, they can't. But you got to be, you got to, um, you got to be. There has to be a reason why you could win. You know, what I learned about Fade Lifestyles is that there was. I didn't have a competitive advantage. I didn't know how to run a cl clothing company. No. I none of us did. We didn't know how to print shirts. We couldn't get things from overseas for cheaper prices. Like we had no business. Like I couldn't sit here across the table from you and be like, yeah, the reason why we should do this is X, Y, and Z. It was more like, hey, I want to do this as a hobby. And that hobby ended up uh, not working out very well. You know, so I think you kept reinforcing on the, like the most important stuff though. Like I've, I've fallen on my face, you know, professionally many times in my life. Yeah. But the lessons that I learned from that, I think they, they kind of pile up and that's what you can climb on top of to get to where you need to go to be successful. Very rarely have I seen people who are at, ape, at the apex of anything. They're like, oh, yeah, I just success after success. It's like, no, man, they they're grinding it. It's uh, when I was trying to think of a name for this podcast, like the whole the whole reason I wanted to start it was to sit down and talk to people about their backgrounds. Right. Who I would consider to be at the apex of whatever it is, business or sport or whatever, and not talk about the apex, but talk about how they got to that position, which I think is the part of the story that's most often not talked about right that was the kind of goal behind it because to me that's where all the meat and potatoes is and it happens to me uh in the base jumping world right like because most base jumping videos turn on 15 seconds before they jump Dude, totally and then they end as your feet touch the ground and that's maybe a half of a percent of the whole activity 
and the other stuff to me is that's where the meat and potatoes is. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, using that as an analogy, like, you know, you think about base jumping. I mean, first off, I don't know much about it, right? Or wingsuit jumping. I don't either. So that makes two of us. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, Just because I do it doesn't mean I know much about it. Well, and, and, you know, you think about it, like, you know, like you said, I've seen your videos where you're just like on the ledge and you're about to jump off. And that's like the sexy stuff, right? Yep. Like, but there's a whole back end of that that's not sexy. But My entire year but, is spent around trying to get my feet to that point that's and right. it doesn't well, show up. Well, like using that as an analogy for life, it's like, dude, it took you probably hours to walk up that mountain yeah. and it takes you 10 seconds to jump off. And I think the same thing applies in a lot of things, but I think social media has this weird way of only showing you the highlights and not the real story. And Selective think, reality is what I call it. Totally. And people need to be aware of that. You know, like they look at different things like, oh, this person's doing this, this. But when you look at either A, they're busting their ass behind the scenes yeah. or B, they're they're giving you a false impression of what their life really is. And I think people need to be aware of that, you know, because like, like you're saying, like when you jump off those mountains, you know, people who really think about it like, well, he didn't just get elevated. You know, he didn't get dropped off on a helicopter. Generally There's right no, there. no magic carpet ride to the top. No, no. I, I was, uh, I think I actually might've been telling Tosh my last trip over to Europe. We hiked about 270 miles in a couple weeks. And I, and if I added up all the amount of time that I spent flying my wingsuit, it was 90 seconds, 18 minutes, maybe. Oh, I mean, we did a bunch of jumps and, oh, but yeah. some of them though are 60 plus seconds. Right. And yeah, some of them time. are a two hour hike for if you really want to push it and scare yourself 13 seconds like the ratio is askew between flight to everything that goes in behind it and then you're studying weather patterns you're looking at weather fronts you're trying to plan your trip and plan it's like there's so much and i love all that other stuff right but it's the most boring youtube video you've ever seen that's right <laughs> well i mean on that note i remember you know we were talking i was talking to my wife before i walked over here i was like hey if there's ever anybody that i would jump out of a plane with yeah it's andy snub and the reason for it is i, I tell people we're all gonna die but you're not gonna die jumping with me no because well i remember you telling me a story oh the tandem story Good oh, the tandem story and, uh, you know, I don't remember what we were doing, but, you know, you're talking about you were jumping out with the, with the uh, translator yeah. <laughs> translator, and the guys like giving you a hard time trying to grab the rip cord too early. And I just remember you putting them in a, you know, rear naked, making them pass out and then driving them into the floor when you landed with him. <laughs> so I told that story on, uh, a podcast called the fighter and kid with yeah. my buddy, Brian Callen and Brendan Schaub. The feedback was split. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, I, I but I, I was like, listen, this that was the single worst jumping experience of my life to this day. It was just completely out of control in a geographical location that had consequences to landing in the wrong spot. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And just, it was terrible. Yes. And so, yeah, I did what I had to do to sustain my own life. Yeah. And sometimes that means you, you got to throw down with the I, I dude strapped so. to the front of you. Well, dude, <laughs> you know, I, and same thing, obviously, when you were on, you know, Rogan and you guys were talking about kind of like the philosophy on life and you were talking about diff a few different things. Like, I know you got some 50-50 comments on that one, too. Uh, you know, I'm glad that I said what I did on uh, on Joe's podcast. I didn't realize the size and the the reach of podcasts at that right. point. I had right. never listened to a podcast prior to going on his. And right. maybe I should have researched that his is like one of the most popular in the world. Right. But I still, if I was, I still would have given the same answers because I don't expect people to look at me and think that, because I don't have all the answers. I have my opinion and I right. have my perspective. And I always, I always try to couch it like that. Like, this is what I saw. This is what I believe. Tear it apart if you want to. The comments, yes, are quite interesting. Most oh. of them are just like, oh, American Psycho, perfect. Perf yeah. <laughs> and I'm just in their lap. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, because I know you. You've and known me for a while. But yeah, I mean, I answered honestly. That's you know, right. I mean, I just, I, 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 I might have used, I would have given the same answers, but I might have chosen to craft it slightly different <laughs> had I realized that millions of people were going to be listening. Right. But um, like I said, I'm glad I gave the answers that I did. So yeah, Joe's an interesting cat, man. He's awesome. Uh, so if you graduated college in 2007, how the hell did you win the games in 2008? Because that's not a lot of time in the kiddie pool gathering experience and soaking up to that methodology. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, granted, so I graduated, I graduated in 08 yep. and I won in 08. Oh, you graduated in 08. Okay. Yeah. So 
Um, Were you majoring my, in exercise? I mean, my yeah, God, I was majoring in yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun, you well, know, for people and you know, for people who don't understand like the a short description. There's a difference between the CrossFit methodology that most people use, right? Which is working out. I'm going to say maximum of an hour a day to maximize the benefit on their life. Totally general fitness, and then competing in a, a competition that is that is driven by that methodology. So multiple workouts, probably at heavier weights, a higher intensity than most people would go to. There's a difference between the two, and, and a, a general CrossFit enthusiast is going to get annihilated at the CrossFit Games, I would say even in 2008, because they're just different worlds. That's right. Well, and you had to train for it. And so, you know, it was the second year. The volume wasn't as high as it is today. Correct. But I what was got the weight on the cleans that last? Uh, 155. Which, what would you say that would be today in today's world? A warm up? Yeah, that'd probably be like 225 today. Yeah, right? at least. I mean, the weights have really changed. But, you know, so what was happening is in 2007, I got introduced, or 2006, I got introduced to CrossFit from Austin and then started watching YouTube videos because at the time there wasn't much else out there, right? <laughs> oh, and, YouTube. And, and, you know, I started training, training, but then I was going to, you know, I was going to school full time, I was going to college. And I was working sales and then I was, you know, I'd work out in the middle of the day and I found CrossFit really loved the idea of the community, the coaching. And so I chose to open up a gym and then, so basically I graduated from college in like July. And what'd you, then, what'd you get your degree in? Uh, business management. Okay. Makes sense. So I got my degree and then like two weeks later I had plans to open up the gym. So I'd already signed a lease. Everything was done. But then like the week after I graduated from college, I won the CrossFit games. So basically I graduated won the CrossFit Games, and then opened up the gym within like a 10-day span, right? Uh, but it had already all been... That's solid. <laughs> well, because you got to remember, too, like the CrossFit Games were right in our backyard. I was going to say, so, for you, the commute was literally over Highway 17. Oh, dude. So like for me, it was a 45-minute drive to go test my fitness, Yeah. right? And then I just remember like my friends and I on Sunday, you know, I won, and we came back and we stopped in an Outburger, and like we weren't like laughing. We were kind of like laughing like... Dude, we just went over there and just won that thing. Like that was crazy. Yeah. So it was just a weird experience. Then I opened the gym. Uh, opened the gym. Let's fast forward to today. You yeah. still have the gym. I still have the gym. You still have a few of them. I was gonna say that's what I was gonna talk about, right? So it, it, it doesn't surprise me that you majored in business, right? Because you took the affiliate model, and I mean, I owned an affiliate for a couple of years, and I mean, it's a challenging, it's a challenging model, right? Totally. It, uh, a lot of people, I did not have a degree in anything. I have exactly zero days in college. Uh, but I actually think I'm probably more the norm when it comes to your average affiliate owner or an enthusiast who goes to the seminar and they want to start. So there's some upswing, you know, up and down to that. I think uh, book smarts is one thing, street smarts is another, right? And totally. hopefully you have an intersection of both. But yet, I mean, it's challenging. So you started your first affiliate in 2008. Mm -hmm. When did you open your second one? Um, 2010. So and that then, was... That Tell me the story of how we got to today, like the, the growth and the business model that you're using. Yeah. So, you know, we opened up another one in 2010, then I think we opened up another one in 2011. And then from there, it really grew quickly. Um, we created a partnership with Western Digital, who's been a phenomenal partner of ours. And so we opened up 10 locations of them globally in their corporate wellness. Yep. And that really helped has, that really grew our business because we, it created sustainable kind of like income and we were able to then open up more gyms. So now you know, we have right around 20 gyms at different places from different companies. And some are open to the public, some are not. We have some in Mexico, some in Asia, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, it kind of just grew organically, right? Uh, when opportunities came up, we we analyzed them. If it made sense, we did it. If it didn't, we didn't. Do you still coach classes at all? Yeah. So I coach, I try and coach every day at a gym. So I visit every gym every week that's in the Bay Area. Yep. And then, you know, I go out to Asia regularly. I was going to say, you do travel quite a bit. So you, yeah. you hit most of them probably throughout the course of a year, do you at least touch each building at least one time? Yeah. So, so before, before Ava got sick, I'd be at all the locations all the time. Yeah. Once Ava got sick, I stopped, uh, I stopped traveling for about a year and a half or a, a little over a year now that she's doing better. Yep. Now I'm back on the circuit. So basically like a month ago I was in Asia and then I leave for Japan. I'm going to Japan next week and then I'll be in Mal uh, Malaysia and then, uh, so basically, I'm back on the circuit to go visit all of them. Yeah. But on a regular basis, I visit the whatever seven or eight we have in the, or 10 or whatever it is in the Bay Area. So why do you do that? Why do you go and visit them all? I mean, mainly, mainly I mean, it's two things. One is just it makes me sleep better at night knowing that instead of speculating how the gyms are doing, I could actually go in there and see it firsthand. What I've realized is that when I spent too much time in the office, 
it caused too much like uh, anxiety. Like, I wonder how things are going. Well, it's like, dude, why don't you drive an hour to San Francisco and go see how it's going, Mm -hmm. right? And then when you actually go there and you see what's going on, you recognize there's a lot of beautiful things going on, but we may need to improve X, Y, and Z. Sometimes when you're sitting back in an office, all you hear is the negative stuff like, oh, this member complained about whatever. But what you don't realize is that's just a snapshot of what's really occurring, and you don't need to get too overwhelmed. Or maybe you go in there and the snapshot is good, but when you actually go in there, you're like, dude, we got to fix some of these things. I see these being problems. So I try and coach at every gym every week. I try. And I definitely try and visit each one every week. That's awesome, man. What uh, I mean, so you started with that affiliate. I mean, you have uh, you got a pretty pretty large business that you're overseeing. I mean, you got over a hundred employees at this point, right? Yeah. What's your what would you describe as your philosophy when it comes to leadership and business, or how you're running your organization? I mean, for me, you know, there's a few things, especially you know, with um, especially after Ava got sick, it kind of transformed the way I look at a few things. But basically, I look at it like. The bigger the business gets, the more good we could do for a lot of other people. So the philosophy is, I want to do what I love for a living. I started off doing that, and then I try and help as many people get in better shape. And then in return, it just grew the business. So now what I'm looking at, how many coaches can we provide a sustainable living for? How many of the members can they touch and actually make a big impact on it? We're not mm-hmm. selling cigarettes and alcohol. We're, we're trying to better their lives through fitness, right? And then through that bigger, greater community, the more members we have, the more they could pull together and then do more for the the outside community outside of that. So for example, you know, if we have 3,000 active members in the Bay Area, that's a nice way to ask them to donate. You know, if you ask them to donate uh, blood, for example, we do blood drives. We can make a big impact because we could have hundreds and hundreds of people come out for that. Or if you do a fundraiser, Mm -hmm. you know, Ashley does this thing called Ava's Kitchen. We have friends that uh, we have... We have, we have a lot of friends in the area, and so we could use that network to raise a lot of money. So I guess what I'm trying to say is my leadership or my philosophy on businesses, provide people with, a, provide people with a sustainable income and try and treat them right. Have them then help the greater community, and then have that greater community then support the even outside community. And then that outside community, as a byproduct, will then just keep this circular flow, right? The cascading effects. Totally. Yep. You know, they recognize what we're doing. They want to be a part of something that actually is about something, right? In Tate Fletcher's, you know, words, be about some shit. Yeah. What we're about is, you know, supporting other families, um, particularly with pediatric cancer and helping people improve their fitness. I like it, man. I like it. You ever had to fire somebody? Yeah. It sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. It's the, experience, awkward, the experience of firing somebody is... I think everybody should have it. I think I think so too. You know what I you know I, I always remind myself though is no one should ever be fired without or no one should ever be let go without. Uh, they should know it's coming. Like like for me, if someone just out of the blue got let go, I think that's kind of not not cool. For me, you should have multiple conversations, whether it's handwritten formal yeah. warnings or just verbal communication. They shouldn't be blindsided by it, right? I would say it depends on what they do. Well, oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, you realize, oh hey, they stole everything from the gym. Perhaps that's going to be a little bit more crisp right. in the letting. Go. Right. But like, <laughs> if they're showing up late for coaching, yeah. If they're, you know, maybe talking to members inappropriately. Well, that's like, your whatever. chance to be a leader of the organization, right? That's right. In the military, I mean, I was, uh, I was involved probably once a year in the process of removing somebody's trident. That you know, these guys have been seals for sometimes between three to five years, and. There's a couple of reasons. One, the military is a huge bureaucracy, so you can't just say, hey, you're fired, right? Because we're beholden to the rules of the military. So we would have to document and mentor and coach and do all of those things and try to give them those opportunities. Uh, yeah, because people think, oh, he made a mistake. Let's just fire him. Like, well, first off, why don't you actually go try to sit across from a human being and end their livelihood and see how that feels? Because right. it hurts. Right. Like, I would sit across the table from these guys. They're great guys. Right, they they've proven themselves. They've made it through some of the most military difficult military training in the world. They've earned their try. They might have even done a deployment, but time after time again, they're not meeting the standard. And you have to look at this person and be like, "Listen, you're done here. Your right. military career is over." And that it it's it hurts. Yeah. To sit, and you have to do it. You have to sit across and look at them and say, "Hey, you're done. These are the reasons why." Document a full dossier of everything that they've done, and then let them go. But that dossier is your chance every time that you sit down and counsel them to improve them and, and in doing so, improve yourself. That's what I found. Sitting down and, and talking to them, like, like, believe me, every time I've counseled somebody, I'm like, listen, 
uh, the mistake or the issue that I'm about to counsel you on, don't worry. I've been in your seat too. Right, right. <laughs> I've been counseled and it made me more capable to sit down and have this conversation with you. So yeah, it, it shouldn't be crisp like that unless, of course, there are instances of that in the SEAL teams too, but it's a catastrophic event. That's, That's the right. only reason why. Well, I think, you know, I think sometimes, so for example, I was at the gym the other day, there was a manager who didn't uh, appropriately communicate to this, to this other staff member. And I went over him. I was like, look, man, you're doing that guy a disservice because you're not setting the, you're you're not setting the expectation clearly, right? You're not having good communication about it. And frankly, if you allow that guy to keep doing what they're doing, you know, you're not helping them, right? Like, I guess what I'm trying to say about that is like, when you sit down with the former, with a SEAL yep. who you need to have a collaborative, whatever, if you don't, if you don't sit down with them, like you're not helping them become the best they could be either, right? Like, so you need to do that. And maybe they're in the wrong position. Like I've had a lot of, a lot of tough conversations where I sit down with some like, look guys, you're a super cool guy and I like you a lot, but I think you're just in the wrong position, right? I mean, maybe you're not supposed to be a SEAL. Maybe you thought you would, yeah. but maybe you're not. You know, like you don't have the mindset for it. You don't have this, this, this. And at first, it's probably super shocking to these people, right? But maybe after more reflection, I'm sure after more reflection, they start realizing maybe that dude was kind of right. I was just going to say, it's. I've found it to be 50-50. Sometimes I think sitting across from that person, you can tell when you say those things. Like, listen, you're an awesome guy, but... I don't think this is the the job for you. You can literally see the wheels turning in their head and they've answered the question that they've been asking themselves. Like, right. is this for me right. in that moment? Or and then there's the other, like, fuck you, man. I'm right. like, okay, cool. Well, you'll you'll come to that conclusion later. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I found it to be 50-50, like right down the middle. But yeah, it's uh, those are some of the hardest conversations I've ever had. And it literally tells somebody, hey, uh, take your trident off your uniform, slide it across the table to me. And just see, because I can, I mean, I had my trident taken from me once. No, <laughs> it's a different well, why story. Well, tell us about that? I already did on one of the podcasts. Don't, don't pull knives on people in bars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can go back and listen to it. It's, uh, that they, I wasn't allowed to wear it. They didn't take the designator from me, you know, and, uh, but I've been there and it's like, oh my God, that removal of something that you've wanted for so long and for me when that happened to me it completely recalibrated how I thought about myself what the role was my behavior how I fit into the organization it was a huge positive for me I look back on it but like I said again it also wasn't permanent but I've actually I've run into students that uh, quit from me as an instructor in buds and then also people who I was part of the process of removing them from the SEAL teams and the only thing that I've ever had any of them say is thank you. Right. Because they, it, oh, whether it was in, immediately or it was over a longer timeline, I think they came to the same realization that the decision was made for their benefit, not me like, oh, let me lo- make a little etch at my desk. I got right. another one. Well, because no yeah. one likes to be a dick, right? I mean, well, sometimes so, you sometimes like to be a dick, <laughs> but you do stop being best, so sensitive. Yeah, but you do have the best intentions, right? I mean, you, 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 you could be a dick sometimes, but it's not like in a, you, you could people take it because they know your heart's in the right place. They know you're trying to do what's best. But you know, I think for us, especially in business, running a business, it's like, dude, you gotta have tough conversations with people. And I think if you don't, it just goes down a journey. Like I was saying this to a gentleman not 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 even two days ago. I was just like, look, man, if we keep going down this path, you're going down the wrong path for what your skill set is. Let's just stop here and revert you into this other path because you're gonna be more successful going down this way. You know it and I know it, right? Yeah. But it's just tough because sometimes it's not what they think is sexy or that's not what they think they want for themselves when it's actually what they're best suited for. Well, it's tough too, because a lot of the times, especially people when they're butting up against a wall that they don't know is there, their, their vision is like down and in on six inches in front of their face. Kind of like you going around to the gyms and, and popping in occasionally, you'll get, in my opinion, a slightly more objective viewpoint of what's going on in the gym. But if you can watch somebody else struggling and have your head up a little bit and see where they're struggling and then also see, hey, if we move this guy over to categories to and do something else, wide open road in front of him, it's, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I, especially when I'm struggling with stuff, like getting an outside opinion or an outside objective approach to it, it's like, okay, I needed that. Because, I mean, I'm the same way. I can get my you know face six inches in front of a problem and get totally lost in it and go down some rabbit holes that are unbelievable. Yeah. You know, it happens to us all for sure. Uh, what would you tell somebody who is considering starting an affiliate? Like if you had, I mean, and here's, cause here's the thing, like there's, 
there's a ton of people out there who want to start an affiliate. And so, and I'm, I'm not saying not try to convince them yay or nay. Like, what are some mistakes that you yeah. saw along the way that are avoidable? I mean, I would say like this, uh, back to the faded lifestyles clothing thing, yeah. right? Is I had to ask myself three questions and I could not answer these with the faded lifestyles. I think every affiliate owner should answer this question or, or, or you know, is it good timing in your life to open up a business, right? Yeah, is your you know, wife eight months pregnant and you're potentially going through a divorce? Yeah. Exactly, right? Because if you can't dedicate yourself to it, you're not going to be able to be successful, yep. right? Um, so is it good timing, right? Um, you know, for me, for example, take the CrossFit Games. You know, I had to pivot once Ava got sick because I knew I couldn't put myself in a position to win because I had other things to do, right? So if you're trying to open up a business, but you have other things, obligations you have to be a part of, that's going to be challenging. So is it good timing? You know, um, are you qualified? Like, you know, just because you went to a, a, a weekend seminar and, you know, you're passionate about fitness doesn't mean you're qualified to open up this business, right? And I think that's a really important distinction is because, sure, back 10 years ago, maybe you got away with it, but now the market's shifted and the barrier to entry is super easy, right? You just, yeah. 50 grand, you got to boom. But the learning curve is super high, right? You got to learn how to run a business, right? It's not as easy as just coaching. How do you get people in the door? How do you, you know, how inclusive is your offering? What does your branding look like? I mean, uh, how do you do a PL? You know you what I mean? Where do you, where do you source insurance? that's actually going to cover you like zoning, right? Yeah. I mean, how many people have I met that have personally guaranteed their lease, but their building isn't even zoned right for their use. So if the government came in and wanted to shut them down, they're personally on the hook for this lease and they're screwed. Because if the if the if the city comes in and says, "Hey, you're not permitted for this use. You need a conditional use permit," and they apply for it and they fail, yeah. they will be shut down. And when they're shut down, if they're still on lease, they have to figure something out. Yeah, you know? they have to sublease it out to somebody or satisfy their obligation. I, yeah. I mean, so really, it's it comes down to you know, is it a good time in your life? You know, are you are are you qualified? And then you know, ultimately, how are you going to win? Right? Like, what is your competitive advantage? I mean. For me, before we get into anything, before we look for a new location, before we do any of that stuff, it's like, do we have the right staff in place and how are we going to dominate and win, right? Like, what is our what is our jam, right? Yeah. And I think everybody kind of has that thing. Like, you know, for example, you're so confident, you've earned the confidence to jump out of a plane and do whatever the hell you do because you've had all these years of practice. You know, what is what is this owner's competitive advantage? Why are they going to beat me, right? I'm a guy who's been doing this for over a decade. Every day I'm researching the industry. Every day I'm looking for opportunities. I look for areas off freeways that are based off of, you know, car, you know, um, work traffic. Flows right? of traffic and stuff, yeah. Like, are you doing this analyzation and how can you sit back and say, hey, my competitive advantage is I have a really good lease opportunity because a friend of mine owns the building. Yeah. I have a really good coach who comes from this background who's inclusive, who's this, this. Okay, cool. So now you know how you're going to win. You, you know, you got this. Now you're lined up. But if you can't answer those, you're just like, oh, dude, I just was like with five buddies. We're at the bar. We each want to throw in 10 G's and have a partnership. It's like, well, all of a sudden, then that passion you have becomes you start building resentment towards your passion. And that becomes an issue, right? Well, it turns it from being your passion into something that you probably you wake up in the morning and you're like, God damn it. Right. You know, and, and a lot of affiliate owners are currently there and I want to help them. Uh, yeah. I'm looking for opportunity. You know, there's opportunities to help those guys. And so I'm going to try and pursue some of those options because I think there is, there is a group out there who are passionate. They're, they're great, but they just don't know how to run a business and we could help them with some of the systems and procedures. What, uh, what do you think is the, if you've made any, since you know, you're the story arc of where you started off and where you are now with your businesses, what are some of the, uh, the things that you can look back on and be like, I wish I had not done that. Like mistakes that you'd made along the way. I think better, better communication with the team. I think just learning how to have more regular communication. I think for me, I didn't know how to manage people. I still don't where for me, I'm like one of those guys where it's like, Hey Andy, um, we need to go do this. Yeah. Like, and then I expect that, you know what I'm talking about and let's just go do it. I'm yeah. not going to tell you how to do it. I'm not going to hold your hand. Just, Hey, this is the task. Let's get there and let's do it. Right. I'm very much so internally motivated. I, I, I look for opportunities to try and be successful. Whereas some other people, they, their brain doesn't work that way. They're phenomenal human beings, but what they like is more clear, concise direction. Yep. They like more regular checkups. They want to have quarterly reviews that didn't exist until we professionalized the business. Looking back on it, I would have had more communication, clear communication, written communication more often because it could have caused a lot of the, 
the funks we've had in the business to, to go away. Yeah. So you say you don't know how to manage people? Not really, no. So I, what are you I, doing about that? So, I mean, I, you know, I think you either, you either learn or you got to hire someone who's no, that's what I mean. Yeah. What, so what are you, are you learning or are you going to hire somebody? I hire someone. Yeah. Oh, you pussy. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, for me, you know, I think understanding what you're good at and like knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know is, is important. I think for me, it's like, I'm a good community driver. I'm a good, uh, you know, coach I'm whatever, but I'm really poor at finance. I'm really poor at setting up an organizational structure and yeah. looking at like a business because I don't come from that background. I come from being a gym rat who then wanted to grow a business. Yeah. And uh, so I think hiring people who are good at those really important who come from a more corporate professional background. So <clears throat> the best, one of the best qualities of leadership that I was surrounded by in the SEAL teams, right? Cause there's always like, there's, it's a rock paper rank organization. Like your opinion is great. And then the dude that outranks you, like he's in charge, right? You know? So that's why I say rock, paper, rank. Cause you'd be like, and I'm a Lieutenant. Like, you're going to do what I say. <laughs> rock, paper, rock, paper, rank. rank. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your hand signal is. It depends on your caller device. Right. And some people get tripped up in that because they're like, no, no, see this caller device. It's bigger or shinier or better than yours. You're going to do what I say. And they act like they know everything, but the best leaders that I was ever around spent a good amount of their time in the beginning because it's a churn. Like every two years, the commanding officer switches out the organization to some degree rebuilds itself. There's shifting of all the people in there, but the best CEOs had no ego when it came to looking at themselves in the mirror and determining where their weaknesses were and then finding somebody who is way smarter way more capable than themselves and staffing that position and then just empowering that person. Right. Cause it's the, totally. it's the team that matters if you can get out of your own way and your own ego and, and realize, and actually it's, it's basically the difference between playing checkers and chess, right? If you want to be the smartest person in the room and tell everybody what to do, you're playing checkers. If you want to win the grand scheme of things, you put people in places where they can do good and you play chess, right? You see the whole board. Yeah. And you empower people. And I think, I think people can pick up on that. I think people can recognize an organization who it has a leader who is trying to purposely hire people who are subpar at certain areas or purposely try and stay in control of everything because they want to feel in control of everything. Yeah. And the problem with that is, is that then all of a sudden your organization gets to a certain level where, dude, you can't be the best at everything. It's just the way it goes. Yeah. Right? You need to hire really good people and then empower them to go do things. And and then you as a leader, it just does nothing but elevate you. It's okay to be in a room and be like, dude, I don't have the answer to that. But guess what? That dude is on my team. Yeah. That, he does. That I researched and found the smartest dude on the face of the earth. He's sitting right there and he works for us. So, right. Bob, right. take it away. Bob, what's the answer to that? You know? Yeah. And, and in doing so, you can sit back and not say a word when they start talking about rocket surgery. And uh, yeah, you're like, yeah, this guy's on my team. Right. Like, but it, and it makes the team look good. And then there, that's, that's to me, the definition of leadership, right? It is empowering those people to like perform. And then the team is just up and up and up and the organization grows and climbs. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a big believer in that. It, it took me a while to get there. You know, I, um, I tell a story about Matt Chan, you know, he's a good example. We're competing for team USA, um, for CrossFit. And I answer the phone. I'm like, Hey, you know, the gym, whatever. Right. And so I answer the phone. I, I was kind of short with the person and I hang up and we're driving. And, uh, I remember him looking at me and be like, dude, what, why were you answering your phone? I was like, oh, well I answer every call that comes into the gym. Cause I want to be the first person to kind of like give them the best service I can. And I just remember him being like, dude, well, you were really short with that woman. I think someone could have done a better job. And at first I was kind of like, you know, fuck, come on, Matt. Like what yeah, are you, you, ma about? you maintain a stone face in your head. You're like, fuck you, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in the back of my head, I'm like, dude, you're right. Like yeah. you're right. My 70% of this, I'm distracted. I'm doing this, 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 right. Your task think, saturated and time saturated. Right. I'm not giving this person the best service they can. Instead, put someone at the office, have them sit down, really dive into what this person is looking for out of their program and really talk to them. And that was a, that was a really like eye opening experience for me. Plus others where I was like, dude, I got to learn to delegate better. I can't do everything myself. And I need to be able to, you know, cause I think business owners, sometimes they don't want to they don't want to take on more salaries. So like sometimes they'll be in a position where they know they need someone, but they don't. Oh, you mean they don't want to take on the obligation of a salary for somebody? They don't somebody? want to take on the obligation, the expense, right? And I'm, I'm confident that if you know you need someone and if you, and if you, uh, if you really know it and they're qualified at their job, they're always going to pay back, you know, quadruple their salary. Right. Mm -hmm. But it does take some kind of guts or whatever you want to call it to take on that additional expense. Right. Because it's easy to kind of get comfortable. Like, man, 
okay, the gym's making a couple of bucks. We really need this position, but we can't afford it. Well, then it's like, well, how do we get to a position where we can't afford it because yeah. we need that, right, to grow? So here's a question for you as a leader of a, an organization that's thriving and doing well. Who are you training to replace you? That's a really good question. I think, good question. One of the, so Paul, you know Paul Gomez. Yep. He, we're walking out of the gym one day and he goes, hey man, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. I was like, bro, what are you talking about, man? He goes, dude, if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, this whole thing is is imploding, right? And I'm like, fuck. Another, single, single point of failure. Another opportunity where I'm just sitting there like, dude, you're right, but fuck, you know? like, Yeah. And so we have people in place at like the management level mm -hmm. who I feel like as a team could take over for me. Um, one individual, probably not this point, but I, but the point is, is that I can't even run this thing as one individual, yep. right? So if I was taken out of the situation, I do think as a team, they could be, you could, they could thrive. And, um, so we're training, we're building up a management team that I believe can, can do that. So a year from now, when I ask you that same question, you need to be able to give me the names of three people that you're training to take over for your role. That's a sign of it in my mind of a really good leader, right? They're constantly training their replacement and making it so that, because I see this in business all the time too, right? Put it in the perspective of a, you got to do a team conference call. Right. And like the day that it's scheduled and maybe it's a strategic partnership with another organization. Well, guess what? Uh, this is probably slightly a little bit uh, morbid, but like the dude gets killed in a car accident on the way there. But maybe we'll back it off that's a little bit. Maybe works. he's got a sore yeah. throat. Yeah, yeah. You know? that's what your brain works. For me, it's but like, oh, couldn't, you know, he's, yes. yeah, yeah, he's, yes, he's, he's dead. You know, he's just <laughs> dead. Uh, you know, but let's back it off to a sore throat. And that one person's not there. And then there's a team of people that don't feel empowered and they don't know what to do when that one person is there. And that's a huge chink in the armor of leadership that I see in business yeah. all the time. And in the military, even in the SEAL teams, well, specifically in the SEAL teams, we trained our people, you know, that in the absence of leadership and guidance, you need to step up and make a call. Doesn't mean you're the boss. It means you're going to keep the ship moving until the boss can come back or there can be a reshift or a reorganization. But it's, uh, you have to teach people to think that way. Yeah. And I think we have, I mean, you know, Matt, who's CFO of the company, I think he's, most in line to take over all mm -hmm. of that where it gets challenging in our business is that a lot of the business is tied to me yeah. because i founded it yep. so it's kind of like that founder's mentality where it's like the founder started it to pull them away it always gets more challenging so i think matt is in a position where he can run the business but from a face of the business that's where we were i don't know what the next step would be for that right well cool now you have your homework because Henry Ford founded Ford, and he's not alive anymore either, is he? <laughs> that company's doing pretty well. That company's doing all right. Yeah. yeah I mean, How about how's Apple doing? They're doing pretty good. You know what I mean? Like it's again. I'm not saying all of those things. Morph and develop into, into, yeah. into something bigger than you. And I'm not saying all those things are small, but at some point, the founder, given a long enough timeline, will not be the face of the organization. That's right. Right. And so prepare the organization for that. So when it happens. Of course, it'll probably be a little bit of a surprise, but being surprised and unprepared is much different than being surprised and prepared. The results can be, they both can be successful, but one's going to have more hiccups than the other. Yeah. So I think we're at a better position than we were three years ago, Yeah. but we now to keep working towards that. And I think it's important too, right? You don't want the business to just be about you, right? You want the business to stand on its own. You want, you want people to take pride in the business, not take pride in like, I mean, and the leader, right? Whatever. But you want them to feel like people love Apple products. Yeah. It's not just about Steve Jobs, right? They love Apple, the brand. They like what it stands for. And that's kind of where we're trying to go. Yeah. You know? I'm going to ask you that question again in a year. And I'm going to answer it. You will. More thoroughly. Just make up names if you have to. I'm going to give you the keys I to got, the test, right? John Smith. And, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Frank, Bob, and uh, Terry, <laughs> they're uh, standing by my leadership. They're, they're, they're the best. <laughs> Problem is, is I'll look at you like you're lying to me. <laughs> So, I mean, where do you see your business in five years? I mean, do you have, how far into the future are you forecasting what it is that you're doing? Not, not forecasting's a bad, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a good word. How far into the future are you trying to put your roadmap down? You know, uh, that's a challenging question. I think, I think it's more of a mindset. So if you take it a couple years ago, it was like, all right, let's grow this thing. Let's build it into something bigger. Let's expand into corporate wellness. Let's, let's do this and that. Then when Ava got sick, it was more like, hey, let's keep the ship afloat. We're not taking on any new business. Let's let's just make sure we're tightening up our systems processes, but we're not trying to grow. Let's let's focus over here for a while. Now that we're like two years after that, 
now it's time to again sh- shift the focus mm-hmm. and the focus now is growth right and the growth is um i would say the most likely chance of it is to grow on the uh, open to the public side right help out some of these affiliates maybe work with some of them to convert them or, or talk with them into becoming one of ours and offer some systems and processes for those people. Do you think that in that, uh, in that move to, for a short period of time, contain the growth and work on your systems and processes, you think that eventually or now put your company into a better place actually yeah. to grow because things were cleaned up? Yeah. I mean, I think we've done a lot <clears throat> of cleaning up in the last like year. Uh, I think we've gotten the right personnel on board who's in line with our mission and vision. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that they... I just think that as we grew, right, we're not the same company we were in 2008. So if you were an employee of the company in 2008, 9, 10, you have to be okay with kind of the the pivoting as the industry shifted. But if you're not okay with that kind of pivots we've made, that's okay. We just have a difference in opinion. Then we need to kind of go our separate ways. And so I think now we're at a place where we have people on the team who are ready to move in lockstep. And yeah. I think it's, I think we're ready to, to grow. Yeah, it seems like you guys are doing good. I, we're trying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a constant evaluation, right? It's like how, you know, it's a constant evaluation. Like how can we perform better? It's just like anything, right? You, before you get into, you know, I mean, maybe you have an example before you go, you know, overseas, right? You're about to go out to, you know, go do some things at night. And you're obsessed with this stuff. I am. I am. <laughs> and you're evaluating like, Hey, you know, how are we working as a team? What's the team environment like? Right. Cause if we're not working as a unit and if we're not having good people on the ship, right, we're, we're in trouble. Right. And that's, that's what we think about all the time is like, how do we empower people better? How do we give them better career growth and how do we have the right people in the right seat? Because if we don't, someone else is out there trying to do it just as good, if not better. Right. I mean, it's cutthroat, you know, like you got guys trying to kill you. We have guys who are trying to kill our business and it's the same thing. Right. I mean, it's not the same thing, but you know what I mean? Like, I understand the metaphor. Yes. (laughs) Or the analogy. Yeah. (laughs) Take it easy, Jason. <laughs> obsessed with the military stuff. Dude, you got to give me one story. Come on. I don't, I mean, honestly, you know, all the books, you know what I encounter most often, especially doing speaking at organizations, is misconceptions. There, I was actually talking with Tosh about this uh, yesterday. You know, the volume of media, book, movie, even just social media, press, like it, it's on this on-ramp of crazy growth about the SEAL teams. When I wanted, I mean, yeah. the, when I came in and when I joined in 96, I could find like a book uh, and it was written on the Vietnam era, which we're talking at best, you know, the early 70s, right. you know? Uh, and it was, it was kind of like just, I would consider it to be a very historical and accurate account of what the SEAL teams did in Vietnam. Now, I go to the bookstore and I don't necessarily like doing it, but I'll swing by the military history section. And it's like new book, new book, new book, new book, new book to the point where they're like, there's more books written about seal combat than any combat that's ever been experienced. If you know what I'm saying, yeah. there's some inflation on, on and some books are, are better than others, but right. <clears throat> the point being that shit's all just entertainment. Like, you know, you, like you're obsessed with war stories and there's nothing to be gained from a war story, right? Like there's really not because I get asked to tell stories when I speak as well. And the one rule I have about myself when I publicly speak or the one rule that I have is that I won't talk about myself except for in the uh, instances where I've made mistakes and what I learned from those mistakes. And then the rest of it is trying to impart the lessons that I was incredibly fortunate to learn through amazing people that I was surrounded by. And people ask me, well, why can't you just tell a story? Like, because there's nothing there. If you want to get entertained, go to the movies and right. watch something that's right. based off a real story in air quotes. It That's not what I want my life to be about. It's not about the stories. I feel obligated to pass on the experiences because that's what I think is important, which is why I never give people stories. And not only that, they're generally boring. Yeah, I, I get that. No, you're right, though. I mean, the last 10 years, right? I mean... Well, there's a reason why there's a lot more books and movies, right? Well, there, we, there, we have been busier, right? We've right. Been. And that, and that's, that's kind of my response. Again, I was talking to it's like, well, there's a couple of issues. One of them, I think that really is driving a lot of it is access to information. Like yep. we, there's nothing in the world that can happen that you're not going to find out about in three to five minutes. So social media also is something new that the community has to learn how to deal with, especially the younger people coming into it who grew up on social media. And then, yeah, well, 
we've been at war for a decade and a half. And before that decade and a half, we weren't doing much for about 30 years. So there's more to talk about. Right. But there's there's got to be a balance that's found because it it's becomes an obsession for people. And then you see people who, you know, you come from that community. It's not about fame or recognition. But these people, they'll pop their head up a little bit and they get caught up in that groundswell of fame yep. and recognition. Yep. And, and from what I've seen, and I always say this one, you know, people who people have any right to do what they want to with their experiences. A lot of people are taking it in a route that I wouldn't choose, but it's their right to do what they want to with their experience. But we don't come from a background of being used to dealing with that upswell of attention. I don't fame's not the right word, but let's just say popularity. Popularity or attention. And I see it really it it's fucking with people's heads, you know, and they're making decisions that are counter to the morals of the community that we came from. And at that point, it's just like, I just kind of step back. I'm like, oof. Like, well, yeah, because they need to be aware that they kind of open up a floodgate, right? As soon as someone wants to tell a story about, you know, killing Osama bin Laden as an yeah. example, right? It's going to open up a lot of great opportunities, I assume, from a financial perspective, from whatever. But also, it's going to open up a lot of people asking you a lot of questions about a lot of things that you probably don't feel comfortable talking about. But over time, you kind of kind of just bite you know, you just kind of got to do it, I guess. I mean, and there's just no upside. The there's, time, right? Yeah, there's no upside to it except for potentially personal financial gain. That's right. Uh, yeah. And I think for some of these guys, right, they probably don't even realize what they're getting themselves into until it's almost too late. Right. I don't think they in intentionally have any ill will. I don't think they want to fabricate any stories. But I think over time, as they're telling different things, not even fabrication, they're telling real stories, but it might impact other people. Right, where it might impact the way people look at war, the way they look at the mission. And well, some of the guys, <clears throat> some of the guys are very deceitful in nature, and it is it is intentional. Uh, and so again, misconceptions, right? I call it the unicorn theory. People think that the SEAL teams is like this magical grass prairie where unicorns are prancing around and there's multiple rainbows and gumdrops are falling from the sky and right. oh look it's a perfect community and you know some of the best people that i've ever met in my life i met in the seal teams and some of the worst people that i've ever met in my life i met in the seal teams it's just a job it doesn't it doesn't say anything about the quality of the individual underneath the uniform so the honor man of my buds class is in jail for uh, murder, him and his wife were bringing people back to their apartment and cutting them up with uh, spider coat knives, sawing them into pieces, and then putting them in grocery store dumpsters because he used to work at a grocery store, so he knew that they'd pick them up on different schedules, right? But he was a SEAL. Right? He's a good guy, right? No, fucking psychopath that's in prison <laughs> for cutting people up with the spider coat. There's a story for you. The look Dude, on your that, face is that's, priceless. That's a great one. <laughs> that is not a great story, Jason. I mean, no, that's a... That's a <laughs> See, and, and that's why like people are intrigued by the the stories, right? It's because yeah. there's just so like I mean, there's a reason why people are engaged in these action films and things like that. It's because it's a it's just so outside the norm of their life, right? And I think I can see that, yeah. yeah like it's so outside. Like the fact that you just said to me, like, dude, I don't know anybody who's cut some people up with the whatever. I mean, and the fact that that's I even, guess I know one. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I guess, but it's just so crazy to think yep. about. And I think that's why, like, even with me, whenever I try and get get in front of you. Uh, I want to hear these stories mainly because like I want to hear about life experiences that I've never had. Yeah. Right now you want to share it in terms of like what I learned from these experiences and I want to hear about it. And then, and then what you learned about it. Right. Cause I want to hear about you jumping out of a helicopter with a, you know, a, a refrigerator to your chest. Right. That's kind of crazy stuff that I can't even fathom. Yeah. But then you learn how to do whatever from it. Right. I mean, it's kind of like nowadays with the CrossFit stuff, I'm not interested in going out and, um, you know, being in a, in a gym, just demonstrating snatching, right? Like back in the day, a lot of people would have me do workouts in front of them or do workouts on camera. And I'm just not interested in that anymore. Like that was a part of my life where it inspired people and it was cool. But now I'm about, you know, what more can I add to their day? Right? Like, I don't want to go out there and just snatch whatever in front of them and be like almost like a, you know, guy in a cage, like showing them something. Yeah. Dance I, monkey. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to now be like, Hey man, let's sit down and talk about like over all the years, right? This yeah. is what I've learned through, you know, competing, right? I mean, I've been in a place where I've passed out, I've I've woken back up, and I've I've finished the events. This these are the. I believe that was like, on the run. That was on the run, but it's just you're like, not built for speed over land. No, I mean, I'm, let's be honest. No, I'm not. 
but like you're built for heavy things attached to a metal barbell. That's right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, those are the kind of experience I want to talk about or like, you know, or even like the business stuff, sitting down with an affiliate owner and just offering some guidance that's going to make a real impact on them. Right. Like it's a, a deeper real, level of interaction. Totally. Yeah, totally. I mean, and that's one of the things I see with social media. I think is interesting, especially for some of the athletes out here is like, you want to have a deeper level of, of getting to know each other because then you can actually really make an impact on them, how you see fit. If you're just putting up pictures or, you know, with you, you know, with your shirt off or whatever, like that's fine, but there's nothing deeper there. Right. And I think to your point, like telling a story for you is like the equivalent of just, there's nothing deeper there. Like I want to, yeah. I'd rather share with you an experience and, and what I learned from it versus just tell you some stories so you can get, uh, entertainment. Yeah. Coming. Your entertainment fix out of it the way. Yeah. Like, Are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I had a sword to throw at people, it'd be amazing. <laughs> Dude. But the, I get what you're saying. Now. Yeah. So I'll never ask you again. Unless yeah. You know, I don't know if I ever even gave you a story anyway, when you would ask me in the past, I mean, no, you, no, you, no, but I, I kind of got, I, I kind of got you to tell me how many people you've stop, you've, stop. Uh, let's talk about your daughter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I watched this unfold from a, from a total distance and I know almost nothing about it. So I will let you kind of explain the last two years of your life. Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, I, I can only imagine the impact on the family. And like you said, the impact on your business, but you know, I was talking with my wife last night and she was like, Oh yeah, give Jason a big hug for me and shake him at the end. I was like, I don't, I don't know what that means, but, <laughs> but you know, her first question all the time is how's your daughter, you know, how's your daughter doing? Yeah. So, I mean, what happened with your daughter? Well, I mean, and, and to your point, you know, like your wife and others, I mean, I'm at the CrossFit games right now and every other person is just like, Hey man, how's your daughter? Yeah. Like, it's not even like, like it's, 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 Hey, I'm shaking your hand. It's like, how's your daughter? Like there's no, it, and I think that's the human side of everybody coming out is like, there's nothing else that matters. It's just, how's your daughter? Yeah. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, in, in January of 2016, you know, my daughter had been having leg pain and, and different types of stuff for like six months. We couldn't quite figure it out. Ear How old was she at this point? She was four and a half. Four and a half. Okay. I mean, leg pain, this, that. And we went to doctors, we went to physical therapists, we went to, I mean, we went to everywhere. Like we were, we were not naive. We were engaged parents. It's just, if you just look at one thing by themselves, it wasn't like, there was nothing there that really like, oh, ear infections. Okay. Leg pain. Eh, okay. Let's go figure this out. Maybe they're growing pains. But then when you start compiling a lot of these things and then she started getting bruising, that was a big problem. So went into the doctor. Bruising, like it, a bruise would just show up or oh, yeah. Okay. Like, like because her blood counts were so off. There were just giant bruises started happening. And that day, I'm like, Ashley, we had to get blood work immediately. So we went and got blood work. And I was thinking like, oh, she had, you know, I don't know, iron levels were off, like platelet, yeah. you know, whatever. Something just very basic. But we come to find out, you know, obviously she gets, uh, she, we went to the ER and all these things happen. And long story short, after, after we find out about our blood work, we get sent to the ER. We then get told she has leukemia. And then, you know, then the whole, the whole roller coaster started. I mean, the, the first, the first couple of days were by far the hardest. And then probably after that, the first, like maybe five months were really hard. And then we kind of got into a groove and then we had like some ups and downs in the way, you know, but that first day was the hardest, you know, it's like you get found out, you find out your daughter's gets diagnosed and she got diagnosed at like 2 AM the next morning at like 10 AM, she had her first procedure. And that to me was like the most heartbreaking, yeah. just the worst thing I've ever seen, you know, because what happened is she goes in um, to get a port put in or not. She gets some spinal chemo, whatever. And that was the first time we had watched our daughter get put to sleep. And that's like the most, that was the most traumatizing part. I think of this helpless entire just, Oh dude. I mean, cause she was just so scared and just whatever. And then the doctor gives the stuff and then boom, she just gets out. And I remember Ash and I just look at you like, wow, you know, we're just freaking out. But it, it, it's interesting how that works because she had a port put in, which is like, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's like a, it's a, essentially instead of going into your IV, it's, it's an like, easier access for medicine. Yeah, exactly. Right? Semi, semi permanent nature from my understanding. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. They have a pick line, which is like semi, semi permanent, but then a port is even more permanent. Like you could have it in there for a while. And, um, you know, when she got that put in the doctor who put it in, I just remember looking at him. I was, I was just broken at the time, you know, I was just broken. And then come to find out a year later, she had to have it replaced. Saw the same doctor much in a better headspace. We had a really good conversation. And I'm looking forward to the day that on March 20th, we're going to have it removed and I'm going to have the same doctor do it. Right. Yeah. And it's going to be this nice, like kind of closing the circle. Full spectrum. On. Yeah. Man. Full circle. And so yeah. what is, what is leukemia? So it's a blood cancer, right? And 
Gen- some- it's genetic in nature, right? Something just expresses or like, is it? Yep. Because my wife was asking me, you know, she's like, how did she get it? And my response was she won the unlucky lottery. That's basically. What it is. Basically, right? I mean, and in the future, there's aminotherapy treatments and different types of things that could work on this. Right now, it's more of like a blanket approach chemotherapy. But essentially what happens is, right, you, you have a bad cell and that bad cell kept re- replicating, replicating, replicating. And it gets to a point where um, it just takes over. And when it does, it suppresses your, I mean, it, it just breaks you down um, and you can no longer fight off disease. I mean, it's just, it's messed up, right? So you go in and... With leukemia, because it is a blood cancer, it hides out really well. So her treatment plan is two and a half years, whereas with boys, it's three and a half years. That's a long ass time because with boys, it comes back in the testicle. Hmm. And so what happens is these leukemia cells just just hide, right? And so what happens when you get diagnosed with leukemia is they analyze um, your bone marrow and they take, a, they take an analysis from your hip. And what they want to do is they want to recognize how many leukemia cells they can see. And they look at it like per every million. And so after 29 days, the goal is not to be able to see leukemia cells anymore. But they know they're hiding. They're there. still there. They just don't want to be able to physically. Right. And okay. so they, they can't find them after 29 days, which like when you get that news. And there's certain days along the journey that are just like days where you're just like, I mean, God's grace has been placed upon you. Right. I mean, someone's looking out for you. Right. And there's been several times of that, which I think has made me a little, you know, I've never been a very faith driven guy, but you kind of, you kind of you kind of find faith a little bit in certain things that occur when, when they go your way. Right. And so day 29 results, big day, but you know, after that she gets on a lot of medicine and watching these different medicines and watching the struggles and the hair fall out and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's a mixture of emotions, but you have the whole family around and we're in the hospital for five weeks. That's a long time to be in the hospital yeah, nonstop. Right. I didn't leave the hospital. I worked out in the parking lot. And then after that, you know, you have hospital stays, right? So what happens is if she gets, if she gets fevers and if she's neutropenic, which means her white blood counts too low, her ANC, which is the absolute neutrophil, which is actually like your, your ability to fight off disease. If it's too low, you have to be in the hospital because things can escalate so quickly. So we had a few scares where we ended up in the ICU. Those were really, really tough. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I want to support the affiliate community. I was, uh, I made a commitment to myself that if Ava, we were like right up against the, the door of good and not good, mm-hmm. right? 50, 50. Um, and, uh, she would either need this surgery to remove part of her intestine, which is like a big deal. Yeah. Or she wouldn't. And I just remember kind of making a commitment to myself, like, Hey, if she gets through this, I'm going to dedicate my life to supporting families going through this. Right. And to affiliate owners that I can help build their business. Cause that's actually a skill set I have. Right. And since then I've taken that commitment super seriously. And we do a lot of things to support the greater community because I believe my wife and I have been super blessed, you know, like we have a f- great family. We're financially secure. And we have the mindset to kind of take it on. And I feel like some of these other families, I mean, you learn a lot when you sit in a cancer treatment center and you watch like kids like, you know, throwing up. In the, it's just, it's heavy. It's heavy stuff. I can't even imagine, man. It's, uh, you know, I don't know if I could, yeah, I don't know if I could handle it with the grace that you guys uh, have been handling it with because it's it's tough to describe to people who don't have kids what it feels like to see something that you love so unconditionally struggling with something you have no control over. That's right. You know, I, it's uh, yeah, I don't know, man, you and Ashley, you guys, you're one of the most positive upbeat people that I've ever met. And, and I hate you for it because <laughs> it's the opposite of who I am. No, it's I mean, like I've always liked being around you because it's like, regardless of what you're going through, you're energetic, you're affable person. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, that's infectious, man. That has cascading effects as well, too. And it's, uh, God, man, it's impressive to it's impressive to watch from the outside. Well, I mean, a lot has to do with Ashley, too. You know, I just remember when the night Ava got diagnosed, you know, I'm like, I broke down. You know, yeah. like, I broke down. I'm just like, I don't know anything about this disease. I just know that it kills people, right? I mean, that's it. How and, did you explain it to Ava? I mean, what level uh, of understanding did she have when she first started undergoing the treatment? Um, I mean, basically what we tried to explain to her was like, Hey, you're, you're sick with something called cancer. Your type is called leukemia. Mm-hmm. And what it is, there's just some bad guys in your blood. We're going to go in and we have, so we had a lot of books that we read that were really helpful. And basically what they did is they equated like the red blood cells, the white blood cells 
to like these leukemia cells and basically how like there was like ninjas, right? And so we read these books to her multiple times. Age specific language to try to, okay, good. And we read like age specific about her hair falling out and different things. And like, I think all of these things we did, like was just a mindset, kind of like a, like we're going to come in there, we're going to crush it, you know? And I think Ashley was really the driving force that, you know, I just remember her saying to me, she's like, look, you know, we were crying in the hallway or, you know, I, I was breaking down a lot. And I just remember she just looks at me, she's like, listen, she's like, you know, you go tell our family, uh, go take care of this, but just make sure everybody knows that as soon as they walk in this room, there's no more tears, there's no crying. Yeah. It's just, we're, 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 we're on a mission, we're going to crush this. And it's just like, it wasn't even like a, we're, we're, oh man, like, you know, like it wasn't even like a, like it was just like, no, no, no. Like, it's like, imagine like before you get into anything, just the confidence that you feel like through your team. And my team was my wife, right? You put and, your game face on, man. Oh, you put dude. all the bullshit aside and, uh, yeah, it's like you prioritize and execute. This is what we're going to do. All the rest of this stuff that's bullshit that's no longer, I don't want to hear about anything. This is what we're going to do. We'll talk about it after we get across the finish line. Yeah. And I mean, and, and that was really helpful. You know, in the, the business, I had a lot of good friends who ran the business. They were able to focus on that. And, you know, we just focused on Ava and I educated myself, you know, that night that she was diagnosed, I must have, I must have read for, I don't know, as, as long as I could, you know, there's a book called emperors of modal emperors of all modalities. Um, it's basically like this book about cancer and I just researched it and I read everything I could and granted the internet, you gotta be skeptical about what you read, right? You gotta be careful where you go on the internet. You, gotta be really careful you could get you on the wrong forum and you could only find people focusing on the negative or the loss. Like you'd be yeah. very careful. But I mean, I was very confident in the fact that like we we're in the, you know, I wanted to rest assured and I had to make a decision very quickly. We need to get my daughter the best treatment period. Like, of course. I don't care how much it costs. I don't care where we need to go. Where is the best for what she has? Right. And fortunately, it was at Stanford and, you know, and there's others that were really good too, but fortunately we can be close to home because she didn't have such such a unique leukemia. Her leukemia is, I don't want to call it common, but they get about 50 cases of it in the Bay Area alone per um, per year, right? So it's not like, you know, one person... Or it's not a just, white elephant. It's something that they at least have experience dealing with. Yeah, just with. even at Lucille Packard, right? They have that many. Just They get one a month, if not more, just there. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, you know... But, you know, I think over the months that she was diagnosed, I just think we've learned a lot about what's important, learned a lot about, you know, that friends and family, there's nothing more important. You know, I think when you're really, really, really in struggling positions, I think you realize who your close friends are and and, and what family offers, right? And I think we've gotten close to our family because of it. Yeah. You know, similar to you, like, I'm sure you've been in terrible situations, but you kind of re- re- reflect back on it. You're like, that was one of the worst and the best times of my life. And... That's why I kind of look at the hospital stays we've had. Even this whole treatment plan. You know, she's done in eight months. Mm-hmm. She has eight more extensive chemo treatments. She has a lot of pills at home. She has steroids. She has three more procedures and we're done, right? Done forever or like because there's still checkups. Like you're obviously going to be once keeping a close eye on this probably for the rest of her life, right? Yeah, that's right. So once a month for like a year. Yeah. And then it goes like every three months. Yeah. Then it goes every six months. But we'll still be going to the hospital. But point being her chemotherapy treatment and steroid treatment will be done in mm-hmm. eight months. And I just look back on this entire thing now that I'm kind of looking back on it. I'm like, damn, we learned a lot about my wife and I, right? We learned a lot about how we handle adversity. We learned a lot about our family and where they, where they sit, you know, like, and everybody sits right. Like no one, no one, no one has shocked us by the way they supported, you know, like we'd wake up in the morning every day at the hospital and we probably in the span of Ava's treatment, we probably stayed at the hospital maybe two and a half months two months we probably slept there mm-hmm. and every day her father was there every day just 7 a.m sitting in the hospital room just the waiting room didn't even tell us just sits there you know just works from there because for a lot of us there's nothing more important you know i think i go to every one of her chemo treatments because i always ask myself like where else am i supposed to be if i'm not there what is more important than going to that you know nothing and i had plans to go to brazil to put on a business seminar and i felt really bad but my daughter was put in the hospital, which was very rare, but she was put in the hospital and we went in there and we thought we were going to be le- released in like a day. So I didn't cancel Brazil because it was just neutropenic and fever. It's happened before. And then it went two days and then it went three days and then it went four days. I'm like, oh shit. And it went from like, not a big deal. Like Reebok came in film because they happened to be there on time. Like then and it wasn't a big deal, but then it escalated to like, well, she's not, her counts are recovering. She's having these symptoms. We think she might've relapsed. And like, it just went from like, we're totally cool. Like we've done this before we get released to like not cool. And that was probably the most out of, out of everything we've been through. That was probably the most stressful time because we were in the hospital for a week 
and the relapse conversation started on like day five and we're like i mean dude we know what it's been like and relapse is 10 times worse because now you're talking bone marrow transplant i mean you could go down a very heavy road right and uh so that was that was a really tough time we we just went through like about a couple months ago they thought she relapsed but the point when the doctor came in so that we got the we got, she was put to sleep her bone marrow was checked the doctor comes in and he starts like talking about like the warriors or something right like he comes in he's like the basketball team yeah he comes in <laughs> and he's like he's like hey guys how you doing and like and he's like he's like he's like you know like um where he sits at like a restaurant or the warriors and i just look at him i was like bro i just looked at him straight to his face what do the results say like I, I, I don't give a shit. About yeah, they would be doing a lot fucking better if you gave me the test results. It's so he goes, oh yeah, no, the results were good. She's she's not relapsing. And I'm like, you could have just opened right up. With yeah, it. totally. My day would have been a lot different if you had led with that information. <laughs> so, anyways, but the point being, Man. Is like, I look back on those times, right? And those were like the worst times, like Ash and I not eating, probably drinking too much alcohol, like whatever. And then and then you get those kind of news, and it's like euphoria, yeah. right? And so over the last two years, I think we've put ourselves in a position where there's been some very challenging times, but at the same time, without those challenging times, we wouldn't be able to feel like the euphoria you receive. It's kind of like, you know, you know what I mean? I like guess it's just been great. It's been a great experience to kind of learn so much about so many people and about ourselves. One of the, one of the things that makes me appreciate life more than anything and the light of life more than anything is darkness. And having seen both sides of that, right? It gives you it gives you a perspective on both sides and you develop an appreciation for it. It's odd. I have an appreciation for the darkness as well, too, because of what it allows me to appreciate in the light, right? Yeah. And for me, I mean, you guys are going through a level of adversity that uh fuck. Like I said, I don't know how my family would, would handle it, right? I would like to think we would handle it with the same type of grace. Uh, but a lot of families wouldn't. And adversity, man, it, uh, anything important in my life that's truly been meaningful has been at the other side of adversity. You know, if you don't sweat and cry and bleed for it, I'm not sure how much value it actually has. Dude, you're totally right. I put up a post on social media about my competition in, in CrossFit and just sharing that I've learned so much about just putting myself out there. Right. So in jujitsu, you know, if you compete in jujitsu competition, you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there. If you compete in the CrossFit games, I have a lot of respect for people that put themselves out there because they're choosing to get uncomfortable, right? Yeah. They're choosing to put themselves in these positions. They're seeking it. They're seeking it and they're going to get better for it. Right. And I think about anything in life that really has like meaning, whether it be having a child, getting married, each of them has these like kind of unknowns, right? And it, it's, it's tough. Like when you get married, you commit yourself to this person, but there is an unknown. That person could break your heart, right? For sure. But unless you put yourself out there and really, you can never really experience like these joys that come from it, right? Unless you have like the other side of the unknown, right? Like, you know, like childbirth, right? I mean, it's one of the most beautiful, amazing things on the planet, but it could also be really probably the one of the worst experiences of your life if that doesn't go as well as you hoped. Yeah. Right. And so I think with with the what I've learned about through all the years with with Ava being diagnosed is that humans at their core are good people that I've that I've come across they they care about what's going on in the world and you know we are n never been more dedicated to support the overall community because we've seen so many families that like you said whether they I think you know competing or you being in the military you've learned how to overcome adversity because of what you've been through and for me and my wife, it's been through fitness, right? That's whether it just be a workout, a 20 minute AMRAP and you're overcoming adversity, you're trying to push yourself, whatever, or you can escalate that to whatever you want to do. I think you learn how to take on like these negative things and it, it's going to help you in life. And I think Ash and I have learned a lot and um, now we want to go out and support families because there's so many that need it, right? And, yeah. and you're passionate about the military because you've, you've seen families affected by your friends dying, right? Yeah. I'm passionate about this because I'm close to it. You know, it's, it feels, feels yeah. right. No, it's, it's in your, it's in your orbit of your life, man. I totally get it. I don't know if all human beings are good at their core, but I have a solution to those that aren't, <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Well, yeah, maybe the ones that I come across, right? I mean, yeah, you're right. Maybe not all human beings, but you know, not all human beings, but I think most people actually are at the end of the day, inherently and essentially 
I, I mean, good. I think that they really are. Right. I think people struggle with expressing that a lot of the times. And I think a lot of that is driven by just weird shit that goes on in society or an unwillingness to put yourself out there. Right. Because when you put yourself out there, you're also vulnerable. That's right. And yeah. Uh, but I mean, for myself, man, I've learned so much from just falling on my face. You know what I mean? That's, a, that's where I think the true growth comes from for sure. Yeah. And I wish more, just more people shared that story more often. Right. I think, I think just people need to be aware that, you know, what you see on social media, what you see on certain things is not necessarily the, the entire story. Yeah. And I think it's important for the millennial youth to realize that like without hard work, you're not gonna get to where you want to go. Like there are some people that represent the 1% of the 1% who maybe got lucky started a tech company for a month and got a billion dollar evaluation hypothetically. But I guarantee you more times than not, those people who got evaluation for whatever they had 10 companies before that did. I was going to say it wasn't their first one. Right. I'm I'm sure there's a, a unique butterfly out there that did everything perfect on the first try. Yes. Right. But yeah, model your, model your life out to that person see what happens. You're in trouble. Right. (laughs) Right. There's no, there's no, like it's, it's hard to hack it. Right. You got to kind of, I was talking with that uh, about Tosh. Do I hate that methodology, the hack methodology? With things that have consequence of any kind, they can't be hacked. And you can't hack experience. Right. And you could talk about hacking in different ways that people have done it. But I think at the end of the day, more times than not, from the 99%, it's get up, grind, get up, grind. Yeah. Over and over and over again for a very long period of time. That's how you make the sausage, man. That's how you make the sausage. <laughs> oh, <God. I> <laughs> So you were all fired up. You said you had a bunch of questions for me. What do you got? What, what do you well, got, Jason? Well, well, I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about. You know, go. I wanted. To, I wanted to get some stories. But what now, kind of story are you looking for? Like, what? What do you want to know? Unprepared as usual. I no, thought I taught you better than that. No, I mean, no. I, I wanted to hear a, a good story being overseas. But maybe back to your point. Just like I don't want to be a monkey in a cage. You don't want to just tell a story to tell a story. So maybe what you could tell me is through one of your life experiences that I haven't heard of what you learned from it. Right. Like, and I'm not referring to like when you got shot. I mean, I'm sure you learned something about that, but I know I learned it but, hurts. Yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> but, and then like overcoming that, right. Cause if people know like you got into certain things and then you found fitness and it really I was down you. the rabbit hole. Yeah, for sure. But I mean like what, and how that, how that experience for you, like when you're in the military, what like, and I know you learned about leadership, you learned about things, but like we've actually seen someone act like, a certain way. Like I can only imagine like you walk into a house and you're, you breach a door and there's a unit going in and you see someone do something that's so selfless. I mean, I don't know if there's a, if there's a story or an action you've seen that was just something just beyond this world. Right. Like, I, I don't know if there is something like that or in your wingsuit current career. Right. Like, you know, the wingsuit thing is just so mind boggling, right? Cause you're intentionally jumping off a cliff. I got an extra one. If you want to try it. No, I, I don't want to try it. Cause I think it takes a certain <laughs> amount of skill that I don't have, but I, I, I think I know why you like the wingsuit. I think it's because you like this concept of, I, I can, I can relate to why you like the wingsuit, right? You like this concept of I, life and death. You like, you, you like the idea that you're putting yourself out there. You like the challenge of doing it and, and it is an art, right? It's, it's a skill and it's an art. But from a military perspective, like, is there one like operation you're on one, one event you're on where you just really reflected on your team? You're like, dude, our team is a bunch of really good badasses. I mean, that's a broad, it's a broad question. And over a career, uh, I get asked that one kind of often, like, uh, stories of heroism, right? Uh, and I've seen some very, I've seen some very heroic things and there's obviously heroic acts that occur all the time in the military uh but people who serve in the military aren't heroes the only heroes of military service are the ones who come back draped in a flag you know flag draped coffin those those are the heroes from the military there are some heroic acts that occur but that shouldn't define you and it doesn't make you a hero right because i know some people who have some really high military awards that are struggling with life in general. Right. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it can't define you even though they try to allow it to. But when I look back on my career, uh, you know, I miss the most, the guys that I served with. And even inside of that, I miss the example that they set because on every objective or every target, you would see micro examples of leadership and selflessness and heroism. And it, and it just manifests itself in, Everybody was always constantly looking for what needed to be done, regardless if it was dangerous or not. If there was bullets flying or there weren't, the most dangerous position 
was always filled. People were always rushing to go to that breach to do something that would allow others to maneuver or, you know what I mean? And like night after night after night, you would see that. And sometimes it would be you making that decision because right. you're forward thinking and you're looking and you're like, that, that's going to suck to move to right there. But if I move right there, everybody else can get out of here and you do it, but you're racing somebody to get there. Like small micro acts of heroism, I think are what define the community that I came from. And I saw it time after time and time. And it just, you know, the biggest lesson I got from that is it's just like, just shut up. Don't, nobody cares about what you say. Just lead by example, you know? And that, that <clears throat> I mean, whether it be in a firefight or a decision that was made, you know, the boss, most people, uh, or not most people, many people equate leadership with, you know, you telling somebody to go do something, go over there and take that corner. Right. To use a shitty example. Uh, I always just saw my boss on the corner. Right. You know, like he didn't talk about it, he just did it. No, and, did, and then it, it inspires the other people, like, God damn it. And you right. go and tap him on the shoulder, I'm like, get out of here, I got this. So you can go be a leader. Like, it's tough to give you an exa exact, exact example of that heroism because I just saw it so often. Right. You know, and it, it wasn't even like a, a one off, it was just the mindset. It was, it was the expectation, right? It was your expectation. It was the I mean, standard. It was a standard. Yeah. And, and I think that's cool. And that's what I think you know, at least for me, like with our team on a totally different level, it's like, we want to set the standard. We want people to just strive towards it because, but it starts from the top, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. But just setting the expectation and setting the standard by showing, and then everybody just, it just raises the overall bar and think about the bar that's been raised at the SEAL teams. You guys get these guys, let's just say 50 years ago is here. Then do, do, yeah. do. And every year the bar just gets raised because the individuals get better. The training techniques Technology get better. Gets Technology better. gets yeah. better. And I mean, just every year and, and, you know, because your opponent is also getting better, you would assume, right? They're picking up on your different If you want to get killed, underestimate your opponent. Yeah. It's probably the fastest way to get destroyed. Well, and and, and so I guess, you know, that's that's a good analogy in all different businesses, right? It's just continuously raising the bar. And I think sometimes people get complacent. And I think in your line of work, if you get complacent, you're probably going to get shot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what ends up happening? I, it's, I mean, it came up, it, the... Trump's tweet about the trans transgender ban, right? So I wrote a post about it. <laughs> yeah. And when I write the post, I'm, I intentionally, I try to be efficient with the words because it's a Twitter script right. attention span. Right. And if I write 140 characters, well, if I, if you write 2000 words, most people won't get through it. So I try to keep it at like around a thousand. And by doing so, you, you can't make all the points that you want to. And I actually have a podcast recorded where I talk for an hour. Just, just, let's just talk about the military and why, the military discriminates every day for a variety of reasons, and, and, and it needs to. But, you know, in the post at the end, it's like, you know, I've seen more combat than some and much less than others. And it's the most unfair environment that I've ever, that I've ever seen achievable by man. And what sucks the most about it is the people or the complacency, it almost never kills the individual that's being complacent. It's somebody else around them that gets impacted by it. That's, and again, because it's not fair. Right. You know, and that, yeah, it's super dangerous, but I mean, I swear to God, combat just lends itself towards, I, I swear bullets veer off towards the most morally worthy, virtuous people and takes those as opposed to the other guy that I can't stand. I'm like, I hope you get shot in the face. <laughs> And he doesn't. I'm like, God damn it. You know? But it's such an unfair environment. It takes the best. And it almost seems like it selects to takes the to take the best. And they're doing the right thing at the right time always. And that's just the way it is, man. Yeah. And I don't know why. I mean, I remember I was at a, you know, I used to do some stuff with the Navy SEAL Foundation. A lot of it, actually. And I was at Did the, uh, the, um, the Half Moon Bay. Yep. Yep. And uh, we were doing Murph there. We raised a lot of money. And we've done a lot of stuff with the Navy SEAL Foundation. That was before Ava got diagnosed. And now we've pivoted, but uh, I just remember this gentleman. He walks up, and he had just lost his son like a week a week earlier, right? He just walks up there, and everybody's super quiet, super respectful. Obviously, this guy just walks up there. He's like, "Hey," he goes, "I don't care about what any of you guys think in this room. I don't." He goes, "I believe that Jesus Christ needed a, a warrior with him, and he he took my son because he knows he was the best at it, and that's what I believe in. That's my that's what my soul tells me, and I'm totally at peace with it." And he just walked off and everybody's just like, what do you, I mean, what do you say to that? I mean, you're just like, yeah, okay. Like if that's firmly in your belief system, then you've came to peace with your son passing away. And, and, uh, there's something to be said about that. Right. Cause 
I mean, I, I don't, I'm not making the argument one way or another. I'm just yeah. saying that was a, that was a lasting impression on me because that gentleman had this perspective that I thought was just so powerful. Right. And he had a faith that was so powerful that he was able to say that and be at peace with it. No tears or nothing. Just, I, peace. uh, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a religious guy at all. And, uh, I'm very jealous of people who have that depth of faith because I wish I could, but I'd have to be faking it yeah. to say that I did. And it's, it, to me, I don't, maybe jealousy is not the word, but I'm, I'm envious of the fact that they have that depth of belief because I just don't. Yeah. You, you know, I, I agree with you, man. I, I agree with you hundred percent. When I come across people who really, I mean, because at the end of the day, it's faith, right? At the end of the day, yeah. it's not like, it's not necessarily science and factual no, necessarily. Correct. That's right? why they call it there's, faith. Yeah. There's a faith in it, right? You have to, you have to be okay with letting your guard down and having faith that this is what's going on. And I think for those people who do have that faith, like I admire it. I, I do. And w for whatever re religion, I don't care if you're Muslim, Catholic, whatever, right? Yeah. If you have faith in something, right, that deep, I mean, I have faith in the fact that, you know, what goes around comes around, that the, that the universe has a unique way of working itself out. Um, but I think, and I've gotten closer to faith from someone looking out for our family based on the experiences <coughs> I've had. Based right? on the unexplainable, yep. Right. I mean, every time we've been there, you know, somehow we've gotten through it. And it just, for me, it's like a sign that, we need to now take that on and then move on and, and do good things with it because we've been blessed, right? By whoever, whenever we've been blessed. Now we have it. Now we need to go support. But back to your point, I mean, those people could just be so faith driven that they could look at it, a situation like that, even when there's adversity, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it's not, I don't want to say it's easy, but I'm sure if you're brought up in a religious system, whatever system that is, and then you don't have any adversity, but you're really brought up in the system and your family's truly believing in it, you probably have a good amount of faith. But then when adversity strikes and it tests your faith, yeah, bends it. To still have that, right? I think is is pretty admirable, right? Because not that many people have that much faith about anything in their life. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's through the adversity, right, that you really take a depth of your beliefs and a sounding of who you are as a human being. That's right. what I think. Yeah. And and I think for us going through what we've gone through, I think uh our faith is that we believe that we have been granted and blessed with with the type of leukemia my daughter got right she has one that's very treatable we think we are we think we are put in the position to then go out and, and go support other people because we've been very lucky and blessed in so many different ways and that's like my that's my honest perception on it like there's no negativity about it there's mm -hmm. no why us it's like i know i was us because we were ready for it we were attacking it right now and now we're gonna go support those others and um yeah that's awesome, man. That's the best clothes we could possibly do right there. You ready to go? Uh, you ready to go watch some fitness? Oh my goodness! Yeah. All right. Go watch some fitness. Here we go. Thanks, Thanks man. man. So that's all we got for today. Another one is in the books. Uh, last week, I mentioned when I was talking with Brian Shantosh that the cleared hot T-shirts are going to be coming out soon. And uh, again, audio only format, but I'm making the air quote signal with my. Uh, with my hands soon is a relative term. I'm trying to get uh, a solid design and I want to make sure that the process is pretty seamless. So if people do want them and people have been hitting me up consistently since I, since I briefly talked about it on episode number eight, uh, as soon as I get them up and going, I will, I'll, I'll spread the word and you guys can buy them or don't totally up to you. And somebody else hit me up about uh, trucker hats, which I never, thought of as uh, something cool to make with a logo on it. So uh, what does everybody think about trucker hats? Because if the response is good, then I'm going to go down that route. And I think that's it. Other than, uh, of course, thank you to everybody who's actually taken the time to listen and tell other people about the podcast. Uh, it's it's interesting to see it from the back end numbers perspective, slowly growing week over week over week. I have no idea who it is that's listened to this, but you know what? I appreciate I appreciate everybody taking the time, and I really appreciate the feedback that you guys hit me up with on social media, whether it's topics or potential guests or even questions that you have. I'll always try to answer them, but I can make no guarantee on the how quick I'll be able to get back to you on those questions. So keep giving me the feedback. Uh, if you're new and the first time you're hearing it, tell somebody about it. If you haven't written a review on one of the uh, podcast platforms, do me a favor, write a review, good, bad, or ugly. I'm interested in the feedback. I'm not going to take it personally. And if it's something that I'm in control of and I can change to make it better.